question. You should assess the time course of jaundice, whether it is an abrupt onset, gradual onset, or it is episodic recurrent. Because if it is abrupt onset, it may be because of CBD stone, there may be cholangitis, acute hepatitis, some acute event like acute Bacchiari syndrome, acute hemolysis, or it may be sepsis. While in cases of malignancy, CLD with gradual decompensation, infiltrative liver disease, or maybe heart failure, right sided, you can have gradual onset. At the same time, you can have intermittent uh, episodic jaundice, like in case of biliary colic or family disorder, like Gilbert syndrome. Then, you, besides the jaundice, you should elicit associate symptoms. What are the important associated symptoms besides just having the yellow discoloration of eye or skin? So, epigastric abdominal pain, epigastric or right hypochondrial pain, associated nausea, vomiting, any prognosal symptoms like malaise, fatigue, anorexia, or even the joint pain. Uh, associated pruritus, uh, change in color of uh, uh, urine or change in color of stools like clay colored stool or silver stools. Is there any associated abdominal uh, distension? Is there any skin problems like uh, easy bruisability or there is a gum bleeding or there is an apex texas or as I told you earlier, any joint pain. So these all symptoms, uh, they may be present in all the patient, but uh, one or more associated uh, these symptoms, they can suggest you that what kind of jaundice patient might be having. So all these symptoms should be elicited because they all have their own significance when they are present with uh, jaundice. Then you should ask certain focused questions and uh, not necessarily all questions should be asked for one particular patient, but in the context of uh, associated symptoms, these individual questions become important. Like patient who underwent polystectomy maybe six months or one year back, now presenting with jaundice. Patient might be having underlying yes, oh. So, the of previous brief test surgery becomes important. Certain other important questions remains like recent use of medications, uh, use of alcohol ingestion, drug abuse, different <laughs> contact with any hepatitis patient, maybe in the uh, family or your workplace, family history of hepatitis or jaundice. Jaundice during any prior illness, any history of uh, sickle cell illness, ulcerative colitis, So these are the important questions that should be asked in a patient with jaundice because each question will give you towards underlying pathology. So like for example, a patient with history of ulcerative colitis presenting with recurrent jaundice might be having underlying primary using cholangitis. At the same time, patient with sickle cell Disease presenting with jaundice, Hello? acute onset might be having acute hemolysis or might be having underlying pigment stones. CBD stones are there and that may cause the jaundice. So each question becomes important. I will not uh, just go into the detail of this uh, slide because this aspect is covered in another, another presentation. Then coming to the important alarming symptoms. These are important. So not just having jaundice is uh, important, you have to look for associated important alarming or red flags because presence of any or more than one of these symptoms indicate that patient is having complicated jaundice may require urgent or immediate intervention. So having fever is important because it indicates that jaundice is complicated by underlying infective process or sepsis. So patient might be having cholangitis, patient might be having acute hepatitis. There may be associated abdominal pain, maybe in uh, uh, cholangitis, acute hepatitis, or uh, Bartsiari syndrome. Patient might be uh, confused or having the altered mentation. Uh, uh, it indicates uh, in case of obstructive jaundice, severe cholangitis. We know the entity of uh, Reynolds pentart. Patient might be having sepsis. Patient might be having hepatic encephalopathy because of uh, uh, decompensated chronic liver disease, patient might be having hypoglycemia and uh, cirrhosis, or really patient might be having intracranial bleed because of uh, associated coagulopathy. So these uh, things should be kept in mind because they, these things, uncommon things may be easily missed. Patient may complain of dark urine. It may be because of, not just because of uh, uh, presence of bilirubin in the obstructive jaundice. There may be uncommon cause like hemoglobinuria and acute hemolysis. Or there may be just gross hematuria because of coagulopathy. 
patient might give you history or you have to specifically ask for any mucocutaneous or gi bleeding it may be because of coagulopathy thrombocytopenia we know that thrombocytopenia is common in end stage liver disease or it might be a component of hyperspinism patient might be having dic or patient might be having variceal bleed we know this is the uh, importance of eliciting the alarm feature we know cholangitis it may be mild moderate or severe depending on the uh, many factors as per the tokyo guideline but uh, classically we know that charcot steroid is there jaundice uh, fever pain abdomen but in case of uh, severe cholangitis you have to additional features like patient is having hypotension patient might be disoriented and uh, these five components they are the part of renaults uh, pentard coming to the examination again the jaundice may be a symptom sometimes patient comes with uh, just yellowness of uh, uh, eyes or uh, skin sometimes uh, they are presenting with just other symptoms like abdominal pain and when you examine the patient you find that patient is having jaundice so once you uh, once patient present with yellowness of uh, uh, skin or eyes the first step is to confirm that patient is actually having jaundice so you have to examine examined with the eyes because iskra is the first site for the jaundice to appear and as the serum bilirubin level raise uh, it is start accumulating in other parts of the body next uh, you have to examine on the under surface of the tongue hard palate and uh, hand palmar creases they are important site and then later on uh, there is a generalized uh, uh, discoloration of the skin so there may be other uh, uh, problems or other causes of yellowish discoloration of the skin like uh, carotenemia certain drugs like rifampin and uh, now we have sunitrib and sorafenib but in this situation again iskra is spared so this becomes an important examination point that if iskra is import uh, is spared iskra is normal skin is yellowish it is not jaundice you have to look for some other causes of such kind of discoloration so there are different important points like uh, you have to look for the age of the patient whether patient is what is the gender because middle aged female fatty classically we know uh, risk factor for gallstones malignancy usually seen in uh, advanced stage you have to look for the mental status of the patient disorientation maybe because of uh, severe sepsis or maybe because of encephalopathy and there are multiple signs when you examine the skin when you examine the patient head to toe so you can uh, uh, find scratch mark then genthlesma genthoma hyperpigmentation bruising uh, spider nevi palmar edema white nails clubbing pedal edema dopitrans contracture again i will say not all these signs are present in one patient but if you find one or more of these uh, signs in one particular patient they can help you in reaching to a particular diagnosis whether it is a hepatocellular or uh obstructive cause of uh, jaundice then pilar may be there it may be simply because of anemia because of hemolysis or maybe because of uh, uh, acute variceal bleed or because of hyperspinism you have to look for the nodes especially in the neck because if they are present they indicates maybe uh, some uh, uh, metastatic malignancy is there and then abdominal examination is very very important because you can see many many findings which can help you in reaching to a particular diagnosis so you have to look for the just visual assessment if there is there any surgical scar because if there is a right hypochondrial cocker incision scar is there or midline scar is there it indicates that patient might have undergone previous uh, upper abdominal surgery sometimes what happens that patient comes from periphery they don't have any record they just say that some kind of surgery has been done we don't know what was uh, done so such kind of scar can give you some clue then look for the uh, liver uh, is there any hepatomegaly uh, what kind of hepatomegaly is there it is a non tender uh, nodular liver maybe malignancy or the liver span is uh, reduced uh, in advanced cirrhotic whether it is a tender hepatomegaly or non tender tender indicates some acute congestion or inflammatory process like acute hepatitis or cholangitis look for the gallbladder whether it is palpable or not whether there is a gb mass or not because this can indicate uh, uh, underlying cause look for the spleen spleenomegaly may be there because of hemolytic anemia porta hypertension look for the ascites again it may be because of uh, uh, advanced decompensated liver cirrhosis or because of malignancy 
look for the collaterals on the abdominal wall, caped medusae, we all know it is because of uh, uh, photosystemic collateralization. Then umbilical hernia in advanced ascites, you know, this can happen. And then umbilical uh, deposit system in Joseph nodule indicating advanced malignancy. And then certain other uh, findings like gynecomastia, testicular atrophy, parotid enlargement. Uh, these are the different all things that should be uh, seen in a patient who present with jaundice. So they are the different physical signs like the basic sign, how you examine the sclera to uh, look for the jaundice. You can have scratch marks uh, because of severe itching, patient uh, scratch all over the body. You can see the scratch marks. You can see the xanthelasma. Usually, they are common uh, around the uh, eye or maybe on the palms. There may be palmar erythema, spider nevi. Uh, this is the small dilated arteriole with uh, radiating uh, branches. More common on the upper part of the body, back and neck. You can see gynecomastia. Then maybe clubbing is there. And uh, like I told you earlier, uh, ad advanced cirrhosis, decompensated, you can have a grossly distended abdomen with the umbilical hernia. And uh, you can see the caped medusae, the multiple collaterals uh, uh, over and around the umbilicus. So not necessarily you will find all these uh, signs in one particular patient, but even single, single or combination of one or two signs uh, are useful to uh, in reaching the uh, correct diagnosis. So these are the different combination of uh, uh, physical signs you can see in the uh, chronic liver disease and certain specific signs related to uh, alcohol related chronic liver disease. So you can have jaundice, but mostly in the advanced phase, then you have hepatomegaly, spinomegaly indicating porta hypertension, spider nevi, clubbing, palmar edema, and uh, so many other things like uh, flapping tremor and asterixis. They are usually seen in advanced decompensated uh, CRD injury. So this is just an uh, uh, overview. I would say if you uh, encounter a patient with jaundice, First, you look for first you confirm whether the patient is having jaundice. Then you look for alarming symptoms like fever, abdominal pain, weight loss, confusion, any abnormal bleeding. If they are absent, most likely it may be a mild, uh, I would say a kind of benign uh, jaundice. On the other hand, if these alarming symptoms are present, whether it is a abrupt onset jaundice or it is a uh, gradual onset, if there is associated confusion, GI bleed, if it is there. It may be some acute event like liver failure. If it is not there, there may be some other benign causes like cholesterol jaundice or maybe hepatosclerosis jaundice if the prodromal symptoms are present. Just to summarize, if you encounter a patient with jaundice in your OPD, avoid the scan first clinic later approach. And it is the set of symptoms and the way in which they have arisen rather than a specific symptoms that direct the determination of etiology. So you have to look for the combination of symptoms, you have to look for the combination of signs and then try to analyze those set of symptoms and signs to reach a particular diagnosis. And physical examination remains the fundamental complement to diagnostic investigation. It is not a substitute. Then physical signs, overall, they have low sensitivity for the diagnosis, but any specific signs, once they are present, they usually indicate advanced stage. For example, if patient is having disoriented hepatic encephalopathy, abnormal bleeding, it usually indicate advanced cirrhosis. And then do not forget to look for the alarming symptoms and signs because they are important and they indicate underlying acute severe event which needs immediate attention. Thank you. We justified the importance of clinical examination in the management of the project. So our second speaker for today is Dr. Gaurav Gupta. He is a professor in the Department of Medical Gastroenterology at SMS Medical College. He will be talking on the ABC of LFTs. It's very important how to interpret the LFT. Uh, from LFT itself, we can prevent or uh, uh, not many investigations. So the investigations have to share the news. Thank you, Chairperson. Good morning, my all my seniors, and thank the organizing committee. 
तो गिव मी दिस ऑपर्चुनिटी स्टॉप शेयरिंग करा ना तो आई तो पण स्टॉप शेयरिंग क्या करना पड़ा ना कर भी अजून तक यार ठीक है सरकार जो नया प्रेजेंटेशन खुला हुआ है ना ये करो सर क्लिक करो शेयर करो पीपीटी मोड में करो बस ओके तो खुला अर्शद का है ना Uh, while it's being prepared, let me just tell that there's a lot of influenza virus spreading uh, nowadays in Jaipur. So, request all of you if you can, if you need a mask, we have provided the mask, and you can use your hand sanitizers. And uh, there'll be a, there's a time limit for all the speakers. So, I think uh, we are allowed, uh, ringing the bell, but you will get a alarming bell as always for last twenty years from Dr. Kapoor. So you will get a bell before at least five seven minutes as an alarm. So please keep sticking to your time. Thanks. So we talk about the LFT. So liver function test. Although it is a misnomer because all the tests do not measure function of the liver. Like tests like SGOTPT, they measure necrosis. So it is used to detect. Distinguish about various groups of diseases. It estimate damage of the liver and required for follow up the disease. There are few shortcomings. It can be falsely normal, like in cirrhotic patients and CPF. It is not a either liver specific, not a particular disease specific. And alone single test is not useful. Will require battery of test to increase its yield, and sequential test and along with clinical correlation should be used in these patients. So there are major test groups, tests that measure cell injury necrosis like AST, ALT, and LDH, synthetic functions like prothrombin time and serum proteins, tests for cholestasis like bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase, GGT, five nucleotides. Although five nucleotides is more, most specific, but it is not easily available. Tests for detoxification like bilirubin, ammonia, and quantitative tests. Tests for hepatic fibrosis, hyaluronan, hyaluronan, fibro, fibro tests, and elastography. But for practical purpose, as you society recommended, LFT comprises of AST, ALT, total and direct bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase, and total serum protein and albumin. So we'll discuss these are only. First is transaminases. But AST, aspartate amino transferase, previously known as SGOT, it is found in many tissues like liver, muscles, lung, brain, kidney, heart. So it is not much specific for the liver. Normal values lie between 30 to 40 IU per ml. ALT, previously known as SGPT, it is more specific for the liver because higher concentration only found in liver, not in other tissues. And it is more dependent as compared to AST on the factor of pyridoxal 5 phosphate. Usually, mild elevation of SGOTPT, especially asymptomatic, they should be repeated for weeks and should rule out other drugs and common systemic diseases like viral illness or other diseases. Transaminitis is wrong term we should not use because it is inflammation of the liver. It is hepatitis, not transaminitis. We usually use it, but it is wrong. TF of the transaminitis in days, AST is shorter. All the time, necrosis is not required. They can be raised by permeability of the hepatocytes also. Level of the ASTLD is not of prognostic value, but its level indicates clinical activity of the disease. Low value, although no clinical significance, but they can be found in the patient with uremia and pyridoxin deficiency. Ratio of the AST to ALT is suggestive of few diseases, like it is more than two times in patients with ALD, alcoholic liver disease, and highly suggestive if it is more than three times. This is usually due to deficiency of B6. In patients with SCV or NAS, SGO, SGOT more than SGPT is surrogate marker of cirrhosis. It's soft pointer towards this. It is in patients with hemolysis, muscle injury, commonly it is less than 300. And it is also 
Initially, it is more than three AST LT ratio, but later on, it is normalized because of the shorter half life of the AST. If it is in thousands, like more than 30, it is usually seen in acute early hepatitis, drugs, ischemia, either active ischemia or passive ischemia, autoimmune hepatitis, acute CBD obstruction, like passing out of stone, acute blood cherry syndrome, acute Wilsonian crisis. In alcoholic hepatitis, it is usually less than 300 IU. Second is serum proteins. All proteins except gamma globulin are synthesized in the liver. So most commonly we use albumin. It is a mainly main protein for the osmotic pressure in the body. Its TRF is around 21 days. It is not useful in the acute disease because of the long TRF. It denotes duration of the disease, severity, extent and prognosis. Can be falsely low in the ascites because of redistribution in the third space. Second, gamma globulin. Mm -hmm. Gamma globulin usually known specifically in treating all liver chronic liver diseases. But if we use some fraction of it, it can help in the etiology of the disease, like IgG in autoimmune hepatitis, IgM in the primary bilirubin cirrhosis, IgA in the alcoholic liver disease. Prothrombin time it is the best marker for the acute liver injury. All clotting factor except factor eight are synthesized in the liver, and Prothrombin time measure factor 2, 5, 9, and 10, 7, and 10. More than 2 seconds of the prothrombin time normality is abnormal. Although labor is common, it should be repeated if clinically indicated. Correction of the prothrombin time vitamin K should be showed to rule out hepatocellular injury. It is not an accurate marker of the bleeding risk because it only measures clotting factors, not anti clotting factors that are also synthesized by the liver. Alkaline phosphatases. It has three sources. Most common is liver, canalicular hepatocyte surface, and very epithelium. Second is bone, that is specially raised in the child, adolescent, and more than 60 years of women. Intestinal mucosa, especially it is useful in the patient of blood group O and A. In those patients, after fatty meal, leads to increase in alkaline phosphatase and pregnancy. It is synthesized on the stimulus. It is not a release from the cells. It is synthesized, so it will, it will take time to increase and also take time to decrease because it's TRV seven days. Usually it precedes jaundice in cholesterol patients by a few days. By to know about its source, best is isoenzyme estimation, but usually we do surrogate enzyme tests like GGT and 5 nucleotides. More than four times raised of the upper limit of normal is highly sensitive cholestasis. It can be extra hepatic or intra hepatic. It's especially useful in the patient like chronic pancreatitis to do the bleeding decompression and AIDS cholangiopathy for early detection to see all the infiltrated disorders like lymphoma, tuberculosis, to see for the PVC in, in the routine test and to see about the overlap in the patient with autoimmune hepatitis and to screen for the PSC in patient with ulcerative colitis or ABD. It can be a low level in recent disease because of the chelation of the zinc by copper. Raised level rule out non hepatic causes. Like if uh, we, we should rule out extra hepatic obstruction by use of imaging. And if not, then for can do for liver biopsy. GGT, although it is not specific for the liver, but it is not raised in the pregnancy and bony diseases. So we can use it along with alpha and phosphatase. It's usually used for alcoholism. GGT by alpha ratio of more than 2.5, it is highly sensitive for alcohol abuse. Can be false positive. The patient is taking barbiturates and phenytoin. Next is bilirubin. This is the more topic we are discussing for this. It is bilirubin is measured drug indirect measurement of the drug metabolism and organic anion transport. And bilirubin formation cycle already discussed. Discuss. The most limiting step is secretion of the bilirubin, conjugated bilirubin. So it is a most limiting step and it is mostly affected by the drugs and other diseases of the hepatocellular origin. One factor is the delta bilirubin. Delta bilirubin is the unconjugated bilirubin that is one is to one bind to albumin. And that is the responsible for the delayed disappearance of the jaundice from the body. And because and in this patient, although the urine is clear, there is no bilirubinemia, bilirubinuria, because unconjugated bilirubin not passes the urine. TF is four hours. Measurement, most of the lab and routinely do, done by one Denver diazole reaction that measures direct 
that is not required alcohol and total that required alcohol. And indirect bilirubin is measured by subtracting direct from the total bilirubin. And now a few labs have HPLC method. Normally it is less than one milligram per deciliter and less than 15% is conjugated. So an indirect hyperbilirubin is said that it is more than 85% of indirect. It has a role in mild and description factor. Urine bilirubin, if it is present, that denotes hepatocellular jaundice, not only hemolytic. So if we have approach to hyperbilirubinia, it can be unconjugated by increased production. In these cases, it is usually less than five milligram. It can be due to hemolysis, blood transfusion reaction, patient have hematoma in the after injury, it can increase in, in ineffective erythroposis like B12 deficiency, thalassemia tract, hereditary like Gilbert syndrome, Kiglanese syndrome type one and type two. We can do help, take help from the phenobarbital challenge test or by UGT1, A1, polymorphism. Drugs like rifamcin can inhibit this reuptake. Conjugated hyperbilirubinemia can be found in hereditary, like Rotas and Dubin Johnson syndrome. They have, they, these patients have only isolated increase in bilirubin, no increase in alkaline phosphatase or SGOTBT. Can be hepatocellular pregnancy in the patient with post operative period. In the post operative period, it is multifactorial, can be drug related, can be steam related, blood transfusion related, TPN related, due to sepsis, ESBOJ, and drugs. So evaluation, we already discussed in the previous presentation. So there is a few groups of the altered liver function test. First is indirect bilirubinemia like hemolysis or Gilbert syndrome. Second, hepatocellular jaundice. These patients have increase in SGOTPT, can have increased alkaline phosphatase. That is usually less than three. And they have, prothrombin time is usually altered and not correctable by the vitamin K. They can have, Cholestasis, intra or extra hepatic. In these patients, protamine time is corrected by the vitamin K and obstructive jaundice or infected disorder. So, first to see the test, especially in the asymptotic patient, one should ensure pre analytic, analytic, and post analytic interference should be minimal. Adding lab should be enabled, accredited, and should participate in the external as internal quality control. So screening test, battery of test should be done to improve sensitivity and specificity, if, especially if we are doing for screening purpose. Asymptomatic, unexplained abnormal LFT should be repeated and should know population normal value. Consider drugs and systemic diseases affecting and local disease pattern. Should have knowledge of the LFT and multi in various common diseases. Thank you. Uh, about the test. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on to the next session, uh, it is uh, how to differentiate mm -hmm. between medical and surgical journalists. And uh, the speaker is Dr. Rajat Bhargav, who is an associate professor in the Department of Medical Death and Clergy at the uh, MG Medical College and Hospital in Jaipur. So I invite uh, Dr. Rajat Bhargav to uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, on the on, at the onset, I would like to uh, thank the organizers. So the topic allotted to me is uh, to differentiate between medical and surgical jaundice. So in uh, the initial two talks, we have already gone through the history, examination, and investigations. So that makes my work easy to explain to differentiate these two entities. So I'll go through uh, the basics of uh, jaundice, the pathophysiology, and how to differentiate the two entities. So this is the uh, the, uh, the diagram showing the pathophysiology. The first part is this, uh, the breakdown of RBCs and production of uh, bilirubin. 
So the defect in the uh, jaundice can either lie in this part where there is increased production, that is what is called prehepatic jaundice. The bilirubin is then bound to albumin, it goes into the liver where the unconjugated bilirubin is converted to conjugated. Important thing is this unconjugated bilirubin is not filtered through the kidneys. So whenever there is prehepatic jaundice, there will not be yellow urine. Similarly, the two other steps is the conjugation of the bilirubin and then the excretion which is the, uh, the secretion, the rate limiting step in the hepatic pathway. And finally, it is excreted through the small intestine in form of stercobilin and through the kidney. So the, depending upon uh, the defect, what it lies, so we can classify them into prehepatic, hepatic, and post-hepatic. When the defect lies before the liver, it is pre, and then inside the liver, which can be either the hepatocellular injury or it may be the intrahepatic cholestatic variety, they both comprises medical jaundice and the defect when it lies in the extrahepatic biliary tree, then it is called surgical jaundice. Uh, coming to the causes uh, that already has been discussed, uh, but uh, the prehepatic jaundice is related to hemolysis. So the causes can be either the diseases like G6PD deficiency and other ineffective erythropoiesis. Whenever the defect is in the liver, like uh, the disease like viral hepatitis, drugs, alcohol, cirrhosis, they all lead to intrahepatic damage and leading to hepatocellular jaundice. A uh, lot of infiltrative disorders and congenital disorders are also there. The surgical jaundice is the, the part of the extrahepatic disease. Here the, uh, the benign and the malignant causes comes where the benign causes include uh, the CBD stones, strictures, post-cholecystectomy, carcinoma, uh, are the malignant causes, uh, polyngiocarcinoma, head of pancreas and ampullary. So we start with the, uh, the details of the history uh, and the points which help us to differentiate the medical and surgical jaundice. The urine color is an important point by which if it is acoluric, then it goes to hemolytic jaundice, the prehepatic one. But the urine will become yellow when it is about hepatocellular and extrahepatic biliary obstruction. Now, the points we have already discussed in the first lecture, it's uh, to classify these into medical and surgical. So whenever a patient has medical jaundice, nearly half of them gives history of prodromal symptoms. The pain that occurs in these patients is related to stretching of liver, which is more of a, a right upper quadrant diffuse pain. Past history, we have to take a history of drug intake, alcohol, alternating medicines. Then if uh, the patient is in the setting of liver cell dysfunctioning, like uh, patients with cirrhosis, they will have ascites and capillary bleed. We can have a family history of jaundice as well as the community spread in terms of so uh, to points the age uh, is again to differentiate and because of the obstruction of the biliary tract there is clay colored stools the pain that occurs in surgical jaundice is either of uh, biliary colic or it will be the pancreatic pain with radiation to back uh, the Charcot's triad and Raynaud's pentard, we have already talked about. So that is, if the history is suggesting that, then we think more of surgical jaundice. If there is a history of lump abdomen, then again, it's a point towards surgical. Uh, anorexia, weight loss is more indicative of a malignant process going on. Features of gastric outlet obstruction, prior history of interventions. So they indicate surgical jaundice. In general examination, we have already uh, discussed these points, but uh, if we have signs of cirrhosis like uh, palmar erythema or swelling of parotids, uh, contractures and angiomas, then they are more indicative of a medical process. Similarly, uh, the chronic cholestatic signs of pigmentation, xanthelisma, xanthomas, uh, signs of vitamin deficiencies like this bitot spots and hemorrhages. So they all indicate a chronic process, a medical process going on. Uh, scratch marks can be seen in both of them, but uh, shiny nails indicates a hypoalbuminemia. And uh, then other signs like uh, the presence of venous thrombosis, uh, acanthosis nigricans, these are the trosia sign that is the enlarged left supraclavicular lymph nodes. So they are all indicative of a surgical jaundice or an obstructive, uh, maybe a malignant biliary pathology. 
systemic examination so uh, we have to uh, do a good examination uh, the examination of the liver so if there is hepatomegaly again in patients with alcoholic liver disease it will be uh, initially it will be a soft and large liver but in cirros cirrhosis it will be a firm liver with sharp borders and when on palpation if we have a liver which is literally hard and uh, there are multiple nodules being felt then think of some malignant process or some surgical obstructive patho process going on. Similarly, spleen can be enlarged in patients with chronic liver disease, portal hypertension. In surgical jaundice, sometimes with associated PVT, we can have enlargement. Ascites, again, more common with uh, cirrhotic cirrhosis and uh, medical jaundice. But in some patients with surgical jaundice, like malignancy, we can have malignant ascites or secondary biliary cirrhosis leading to ascites. Palpation of a lump of gallbladder, it indicates a uh, uh, the surgical part that is the obstructive jaundice, more commonly the malignant one, succussion splash, gastric outlet obstruction, they both uh, indicates a surgical jaundice. Now, the uh, another important thing in surgical jaundice is the Carvosius law. So when there is obstruction of the duct by a stone, dilatation of the GB do not occur because it is shrunken because of the repeated episodes of cholecystitis. So the application of this law states that in patients with obstructive jaundice, if we have a palpable gallbladder, it is unlikely due to stones. So a palpable gallbladder, it indicates surgical jaundice uh, in this perspective and also more commonly a benign. So it can be either a soft cystic lump in uh, periampillary malignancies or uh, the carcinoma pancreas or in patients with GB uh, malignancy, we may have a hard palpable GB. So uh, the exceptions to all uh, this law are there that if a stone is impacted at the uh, cystic duct and the lower end of CBD, sometimes the Mirzi syndrome and the mucosal, they can have a palpable gallbladder. So after history and examination, some basic investigations also help us. So uh, the important thing is this unconjugated bilirubin is rise in prehepatic one and predominant conjugated hyperbilirubinemia is seen in the hepatic and the post-hepatic jaundice. Urine, we can assess, we can do a simple urine examination. Presence of bilirubin will be more in the cholestatic and hepatocellular variants. However, it will be absent in prehepatic because here the main bilirubin is unconjugated. Then comes the liver function test. We already have discussed. Uh, important thing is the AST, LT or OTPT are raised in hepatocellular jaundice predominantly. Alkaline phosphatase rise of more than three times with rise in gamma GT and five days nucleotidase indicates cholestatic jaundice. It can be intrahepatic as well as uh, extrahepatic cholestasis. Prothrombin time is increased in both of them in advanced cases and it is correctable with vitamin K when it comes to post-hepatic. And low albumin, again, the half-life is 21 days. So chronic uh, medical diseases will have a low albumin. So uh, basic approach is like whenever any patients come with the jaundice, we have to take a good history examination, do simple urine and basic liver function tests and blood tests. So what patterns we can get is either there is increased unconjugated bilirubin. So that can either occur with the hemolysis or the deficiency of enzyme UGT1A1 leading to Gilbert or Krigler nazar 1 and 2. So this is unconjugated type. When we have patients with high conjugated bilirubin and abnormal liver test, we think of hepatocellular medical jaundice. And in this, we have to work up for the various causes. And if uh, that is negative, we have to rely on imaging and patients with autoimmune hepatitis may need liver biopsies. Then the unconj uh, rise conjugated with cholestatic pattern, it can be either the intrahepatic cholestasis or the extrahepatic. So when we have surgical extrahepatic jaundice, we have to do imaging. So imaging is the confirmatory test, which finally help us in multiple things. First thing is to make it sure and confirm because sometimes even after history examination and investigations, we are not sure. So we have to look at IHBR and dilated CBD. So that confirms that it is extra hepatic or surgical. We have to look at the level of obstruction, confluence and the cause of obstruction. So that is to be defined. So in the last, uh, I'll just uh, briefly discuss imaging. I think we will discuss them in detail later on. So ultrasound is initial imaging, which is easily available and non-expensive. What we can look is dilated intrahepatic radicals and uh, dilatation of the, uh, like this proximal CBD and uh, distal CBD narrowing. 
problems are that it has uh, a low accuracy in patients with cirrhosis and cholangitis. Uh, it will not show dilatation. The differentiation between benign, malignant, and uh, the resectability cannot be assessed. So uh, the other imagings that further help us in differentiating is uh, the CT scan, uh, which may show uh, just like this, uh, showing a hilar mass and the, uh, the dilatation of intrahepatic radicals. So we are very clear that we are dealing with a malignant pathology. Uh, MRI, MRCP, uh, further uh, showing a double duct sign and the presence of a periampillary tumor. ERCP and EUS are other modalities which have diagnostic and uh, therapeutic role. So I'll just end my talk uh, that uh, jaundice can be uh, medical and surgical. The medical includes the causes which are prehepatic and hepatic. The post-hepatic obstructive causes are surgical. A good history uh, in detail of uh, the, uh, the present past family as well as uh, the science of examination that we illustrated can classify most of them uh, with support of blood and urine investigations. Ultrasound is initial imaging and at this point we can nearly classify nearly 100% whether it's pre hepatic or post hepatic CTMR can help us in de uh, de deciding the level and cause and ERCP at present is mainly a uh, therapeutic uh, purpose. It is not done uh, diagnostically. EUS is a newer imaging modality, which has diagnostic as well as therapeutic role. Thank you. I think now uh, of the conclusion of these lectures, uh, and for the chairperson's remarks, and uh, at the onset, I uh, thank the professor. Peter Kapoor sir, in the panel of the teacher, a still renowned uh, teacher to me, and the organizers, Dr. Ajay and the rest of the team. Uh, it's very, very important for the PG is when they are first appearing for the MS of the examination. They were given a case of jaundice, then they have to differentiate on the basis of the clinical examination, history and the examination. Three points I'd like to highlight that uh, everything has been covered nicely by the speakers, but certain things. Like especially the program on symptoms, you should always ask this thing and give it in the negative history. Do you think it is a surgical obstructive jaundice? And uh, it is a vital mark of the hepatic cellular disease. Then coming to the progression, naturally, even uh, if you remember the Benjamin classification, whether it's uh, abrupt onset because of the complete uh, bile duct obstruction. Or is it a progressive gradual disease or is a vaccine and any phenomena? Then the association of the pain is very important because there are certain classical groups of painless and jaundice with pain. Urine color, of, of course, it has been elaborated very nicely, but just to recapitulate a brown urine, hemolysis, yellow, again, uh, hepatocellular and late onset polycystic urine may be yellow, but obstructive jaundice, it may reach up to a mustard color. Red donates uh, hematuria as coagulopathy and orange, which can be because of drug induced, because uh, ATT very common in our country, the cannabis induces an orange color to the urine. A little bit of confusion, I, I'll talk about the clay color is true because actually our clay is not that white or uh, it is dark colored. Many PGs get confused. Clay color is the China clay and is pale in color. But actually, when there is obstruction for long and it persists, the stool changes to silvery pale texture. Is actually what you call it as the aluminum pale kind of thing, which is entirely different because of malabsorption and A. coli disease. So, uh, examination also, it has been covered nicely. Uh, a good history of examination definitely uh, gives you a very vital clue whether it's a surgical jaundice or obstructive jaundice or even a uh, cumulative jaundice. So, pass uh, other person to comment on. The topic ought to be going to be covered by uh, topic of approach to the patient with jaundice, in particular, the difference between the medical jaundice and surgical jaundice. And then my personal experience when I was the first year PD, my guide and the CG guide and the Edward Watson got the jaundice. He treated as medical jaundice. And finally, after two to three months of the saw the complication, he was finally diagnosed with severe stone. 
then you implement for your CP and cholangitis of triple contagion and pipe. And I have seen all the activations of orbital first step of BD only because at that time it was not, not such investigation or MRC and entries are available. So, nothing already very much covered and expert government like the survey is already done. The last uh, topic of the what is question on the question on the question. Dr. Kulbushan Haldia and the assistant professor in the Department of System Therapy at the Times Hospital. Over to Dr. Thank you very much, sir, for such a wonderful talk. Uh, my question to uh, Gaurav, sir. Uh, sir, Delta Bluebin, sir, how much time it will take to disappear? Sir? It, it, it can take two to three weeks to disappear, and during color becomes clear. And uh, sir, my other question with uh, uh, to Vishal, sir. Sir, is there any uh, cutoff value of label of lurubin by which uh, in obstructive jaundice that you can say is it malignant or benign, sir? You can see different at all. Maybe 10, maybe 15, even seeing some CD discount. But higher value, the more chances of having the relevancy. Even that in benign condition, you can see even up to 14, 15, or maybe 20. If there is associated renal failure, secretion would be less. If renal failure is there, even with the mild obstruction, you can have a higher CD. So there is no cut off like 10 or 15 beyond which you can definitely say it is relevant or what is Thank you, sir. Sir, my uh, another question. Uh, so what is difference between intermittent or fluctuating jaundice, sir? Fluctuating <clears throat> basically you rely on the patient's history. And it all depends on the how patients give you that kind of history. Because it is an intermittent of the fitting, basically, it is more or less painful. We don't know in between patient was totally a jaundice or fluid LFT was totally normal. But indirectly, yes. What's the severity of your uh, discoloration in eyes or during the birth? It varied over a period of time. So that can give you some kind of information when it was fitting or it was intermittent. But Thank you, sir. One question which is always asked, I mean, I asked that if the PG said, okay, if you tie up the bile that, how much will the value be rise? Now, will it go indefinitely, keep on rising? It's going to plateau. So that's very interesting question because the value will never rise in 33, 35. It always stabilizes if you tie it and leave it completely. It will never write a certain mechanism. Then what you have is known as a white bar. Because now the bilirubin signature is replaced by only mucus and the watery signature. So that's a you know trick question. Also, uh, sir, uh, any, any more questions from the audience? Yeah, that's what I also wanted to just emphasize. I think Kulbushan has taken up the questions well, but uh, I would like, on behalf of our team, we would like to have more uh, questions from the students, from the postgraduates. I can put in some questions for the PGs. Okay, so you will have a backfiring if you don't have a firing from your side. So we have to. So it's the sad mark of pruritis uh, from dermatitis and obstructive jaundice. Anyone, can you differentiate uh, from in a, in a scratch mark? Whether this is really a scratch mark, but how to differentiate it because of dermatitis or because of obstructive problems. Can anybody take that? Any of uh, residents? Well, I think uh, uh, just because of the time of answering that, that actually is an important question. The patient with obstructive problems, let's say, Chronically malnourished, often harbors fungal disease, dermatosis. They are specific to certain 
area, royal area, the seven regions, and uh, the, the dermatitis or the pruritus or constructive joints would be on the limb with the trunks. Plus, they are going to have that scratch mark with trademarks because there will be coagulopathy and there will be, you know, uh, kind of uh, bruising around that scratch mark, which actually differentiates for person with dermatitis not going to have any coagulopathy. That's one question. And uh, uh, while we are having second question, uh, let me uh, just announce that we want to have more active interaction from the residents. So uh, we want more number of questions to be asked from you. And uh, so I take uh, this, I've just decided, this was not pre-decided. The person, people will appoint five people who ask the maximum number of questions in today's evening till tomorrow evening. Five people will be selected and they will be awarded the book of Pearls of Surgery by Dr. V.K. Kapoor. I just requested him that, and he had agreed to it, and thanks to him. So uh, we will choose five best residents, five best people who are asking the questions. Your questions may be valid, may be invalid, may be relevant, may be non-relevant. Understand, when I was doing MS, most of my questions were irrelevant. So don't mind on that, keep on asking. And we have one judge for you, Dr. Vinay Mehla, we appoint as a judge who will keep a record of all the residents and at the end, he will decide that who are the five best questions are asked. Thanks. So, for, so keep on asking your questions. This one point is a little question. This asks about the difference between intermittent and fluctuating joints. I mean, I guess the difference is all like saying like intermittent and fluctuating fever. Intermittent means it reaches the baseline when fluctuating never means it. So it's been a chronic joint scenario, it has some significance. For example, if a patient comes to me with chronic intermittent jaundice, you look at more, more of Gilbert's thesis, you are coming in traffic to those things and it's fluctuating jaundice, that means it never means that it could be chronic hepatitis or a person has a few you know, I think I pointed out that the part because you'll get in the row and the Actually, it's quite common to be with people, even the initial having fat meeting joint because with the stress, the delivery is very obviously at home. I've seen patients where they even got pregnant with pulse and they get alarmed that, okay, what was the problem? Then the uh, gastric employees, of course, reassure them that unless it is not very high, it doesn't require any pulse. And one more uh, common problem in the day to day clinical scenario we see is. You know, fatty liver is extremely common. Uh, so, you know, half the urban population has it, and then coming with overlapping Gilberts. So, it's very uh, common to think then to think that it's a hepatitis, fatty liver related NASH. But I'm sure the medical guys are going to join this epidemic in fatty liver is a very great sign. People may swing cirrhosis and other things. Four dimension, low plate, that's why it's mostly NASH with more of transmenitis rather than Gilberts. Next session, so after this important announcement from Dr. Ajay, the race has already started. We have received two questions from the audience, online questions. First is from Dr. Pavan. What should be the cutoff of bilirubin levels for operating a malignant obstructive joint? Uh, we usually there is no such cut out, but for it depends upon the level of load. In the patient with the level load, because in these patients they require liver section also along with in this surgery, they have lower cut -offs. They are usually it should not be more than eight or ten. And in the lower end block, this is people are trying in more than 15, but there certain people try to do such deeper surgery and are really like level is not the deciding factor for uh, surgery. Okay, the second question is Is fluctuating jaundice also possible in top apart from peri and jewelry surgery? Usually it is not, it is progressive jaundice, but if the patient have only is like colon is for the treatment, it cannot be. Classical, it gets impacts and disimpacts. Classical, 
On an average, how long does it take for the bilirubin levels to reflect in biochemical tests after by the changing? I repeat, on an average, how long does it take for the serum bilirubin levels to reflect in biochemical tests after a by the changing? It depends on the type of pilot injury. It's a complete ligation to the level would work very early in the immediate post op. But if it's, uh, you know, a myeloma getting absorbed, uh, uh, the level of elevation may, may be there, but not much. Or if there's a complete fistula coming at the time of the day, the elevation will be completely normal. Generally, one important thing about the pilot injury is that, you know, when there's a complete cutoff in the later on, so early this is the sort of pattern. This full ligation, very rapid rise, and uh, myeloma slow rise, and if it's a fistula, no rise. But in the long run, also one of the things we have is when there's a complete structure in uh, you know uh, BBS, so you would expect the balloon levels to go very high up, and people by the waiting facility they think of PDP and all that, but it's not really needed. There's almost unlike obst malignant obstructive jaundice, even in a complete cutoff in BBS, there's almost Inevitably, we see that there's a small ability entry fistula. It's almost always there. So the levels never really go up very high in uh, post post treatment videos. We can go with the last question. <clears throat> How to find the level of block in extra effective biliary obstruction from his face? Sir? Somebody gives a history of uh, GB levels. Uh, it's not that possible, but some patient notices lump of a gallbladder. So if that is there, then uh, lower end block can be uh, think of that is there. Otherwise, on examination, we can still make it up. But, Thank you very much. Thanks for Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. For the next session, next session will be on investigation.